going down, my beautiful people. Welcome to the first episode of the Light Force Centers podcast. We are exploring everything related to ancient healing for the new earth. And this has been a long time coming today. We are here with my beautiful wife, Shayun, and myself. And we are in Bali right now, in Uluwatu, and we're gonna tell you our story. We're really gonna dive into our path of awakening, and we're gonna talk about consciousness, and we're going to talk about all of the factors related to that exploration in hopes to help you on your journey and to awaken. What else is this podcast about? What are we gonna be getting into? The, First into of all, this? I'm so excited that we're finally here um, recording this because it's been a long time coming so thank you so much for watching thank you for listening and we hope that you find a lot of value in this and we hope to um, inspire you as well what did you ask me sorry <laughs> I was asking you about what what are we hoping to really explore with this podcast and why why do you feel like it's different so I think that we are really different in our terms of how we use healing to basically overcome all the obstacles of trauma and abuse and things that people suppress. I think our mo modalities and the way in which we do it is so different from what's out there. In fact, not just saying this to say it, but I've never seen anyone do what we do. And that's why we're doing it now because we tested it for so many years and we yeah. tested it privately for a really long time um, because we were so one foot in, one foot out. We were doing healing and we were in the fashion scene and we were in the entertainment scene and we were in the disruptive scene and mm -hmm. we were like influencing the influencer and always like curating conscious, you know, people together. But we did so much that um, we didn't develop what we had created so many programs of fully until now we have this masterpiece, which is something we were dying to share with all of you guys and bring it to the world. And um, I just feel like what sets us apart is that we're not therapists at all. Mm -hmm. Nowhere near that. Mm -hmm. um, we feel that if you don't get value and you're not healed or transformed within a few weeks and we haven't done our job, we feel that it is not something that you need to come back for over and over and over again. And it's something that we can just get to the root, cut it, and you're done. And mm -hmm. then we move you into your purpose work. And mm -hmm. so I don't think I've seen anybody talking about this. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't see, I've seen people who are motivational speakers and are, you know, encouraging people to be happy. But where does happiness come from? How do you teach happiness? Mm -hmm. You go inside and you dig it out and you cut it out and mm -hmm. we're, well, that's what we're doing, right? Yeah, cutting out the things that don't serve you. And so also what we aim to explore on this whole show is bringing people from around the world that are truly pushing the boundaries as it relates to art, as it relates to sustainability, as it relates to creating the new world, as it relates to creating movements, as it relates to raising consciousness. I think that spirituality, right, It's um, it's got this kind of um, connotation like you're either spiritual or you're not but the fact is is that we are all spiritual because we all are spirits we all have soul and we're all integrated into this body living this existence for a reason we want to explore all the multi facets of that we're going to be bringing on incredible guests incredible speakers we're going to be bringing the the emerging the worlds of digital and art and fashion and culture and making this whole concept of spirituality and healing and growth cool because it is fucking cool and and we should all be talking about this and i think now is the most important time there's never been a better time with this whole woke movement taking place and consciousness rising and we're seeing the light and the dark clash and we're seeing the divides and we're seeing the whole world transforming now so as the sediment stirs up we're going to be bringing out those pieces and bringing them right in here so that's something that you can use weekly we're going to drop an episode a week so you can at least tune in you know that you are going to be getting a conscious vibration that's going to raise your heart raise your frequency raise your life and give you motivation to pursue your own path because that's what this is all about so Woo! yeah without further ado should we dive in i want to talk to you okay what's that <laughs> so um i think you know the first thing is is i 
you know, for those of you who don't know us, and, and even if you think that you know us, we've never really gone this intimate, like we're about ready to, and really just share our whole experience. So let's start with our story, and let's start with you, Shayun. Where were you born? Where are you from? <laughs> I'm not from here, actually. <laughs> um, I was born in Nairobi, Kenya. I am African by my father's side, my mother's side, um, my grandparents, but um, my family has roots in India and Pakistan, and um, I grew up in a very diverse cultural, religious background, mm -hmm. um, stemming from, you know, a, a big Muslim family, both sects, Sunni mm -hmm. and Shia, Ismaili. Does that happen? Is that common? It's, you know, it was a no-no. Mm. It was like a Romeo and Juliet situation. It's just uh, a divide. Mm. It's something put there to divide, right? Mm -hmm. And my parents said, you know, fuck you to that. And they got together and uh, it, it brought tension in their families as well. And um, the beauty about it, though, is I got to learn so many cultures and religions my whole life because growing up in Kenya, um, there was no divide. We were all one. Like we were friends with the the Sikh Punjabis. We were friends with Gujaratis. That's why I know all those languages. That's mm -hmm. why I can um, my deep love for Punjabi music and for the culture comes from because we were all together. And and what the African tribes too, right? The African tribes, um, my Maasai tribes, the people I grew up with. Um, have a huge influence on how I see the world today mm. because I do remember the unity. I remember the divide when we moved to America. Ah, really? Yeah. So when so growing up in Africa and you were young, you you remember that unity. I mean, I remember the unity. I remember my parents throwing the biggest parties and everybody was from somewhere else. They were from a different race, religion, mm. sect. It didn't it didn't matter at all then and. Um, I remember coming to the States and growing up, seeing everyone really focused on a certain religion, really focused on a certain sect, color of your skin, racism. Oh my God, I was a victim of racism um, thrown in Oklahoma, you right, know? Right, 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 right. I went from Africa to England to Oklahoma, you know? Backwoods, <laughs> backwoods. So. I mean, much love to all the all the homies in OKC, you but... You can't talk shit backwards. You were in the fucking <laughs> woods of Oregon, bro. That's true. So, it was, a, it was a culture shock and a mind fuck, but what I did realize was the community. Um, community is the new currency, right? But community of religion, I, I saw that there was more in the in the restrictions of the community culture than what actually the religion states, mm. right? So in Islam, we're looked down upon by many that don't know the real religion because they are fed different things by media and whatnot, right? right. What, like, so, so I mean, from my perspective, it's, it, at least then it was like, if you're a Muslim, you're a terrorist. Yeah. That's it. Especially then. You know? Yeah, and I think it probably still plays out now, but yeah. what you're saying is that there's a much deeper beauty to it than people realize, right? Yeah, absolutely. And um, Islam is one of the most beautiful religions, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and, but what I was turned off by, which is ironic because I love my culture so much, from the food to the people to the music to all of that, is the actual people and the people who live for other people's opinions, the people who mm. thrive off of something that is non-existent, and they put that upon the children. Mm. And so you get submersed and stuck into a culture where you love everything else about it, but it's fucking fake. So what, what you're saying is that you've got the religion, which is one thing, the teachings yeah. are beautiful and yeah. pure, and then you've got the culture that's almost wrapped around it that distorts what the true message is, is that correct? Yeah, in some ways. I mean, we all have different beliefs in what is said in, um, in religious text, right. of course. And we'll get into that Most later. of it huh. I, I um, resonate with. Right. A lot of it I don't. Yeah. A lot of it is he said, she said as yeah. well, right? So the prophet did this, so you need to do this. Or, you know, you can't wear nail polish while you pray because you're not clean. Or you can't pray when you're on your period. Because you're dirty. 
because you're dirty. Right. Um, but the true teachings of the actual knowledge and the intelligence that goes behind certain things of everyday life and actual philosophical sayings, you know, mm-hmm. um, that I resonate with. Mm-hmm. But the culture, for example, of when you're with your community and you're with your parents and you're surrounded by all of these people who make you feel um, lesser than because you express yourself in a different way. Mm. Um, it wasn't, I wasn't about it. And so what happens to us children is that our voices become suppressed Mm -hmm. and we feel like we have to keep up an image of whatever it is that the community should see us as Mm -hmm. versus who we really are. And that fucked me up. You know, it really did. And it's, I look back now and I still see it happening and it makes me really sad because 99% of the people I even grew up with still to this day can't confront Mm. their voice to their parents. They they can't confront what it was that, you know, they truly wanted or needed. So there's that part of the culture. So right? suppression, so suppression of voice being a really big thing. And we see it Huge. in a lot of the students that we work with that are coming out of the Daisy communities, yeah. right? Especially women. Can you maybe speak uh, a little bit more about what you went through as, um, as a woman in that culture and that religion and how that made you feel? <laughs> sure. You want to go there? Yeah, let's go there. <laughs> let's go there. Oh, man. So here's how, I, here's how I look at it now. If you don't know and you haven't been educated and you haven't awakened to what it, it really is like on the other side, mm-hmm. it's not your fault. I want right. to start there. I'm not hating. No blame. No blame. I'm no not blame. hating. All I'm love. not blaming. All love. It's all love. However... <laughs> However, this comes into conscious parenting, which is what I, I'm a big advocate for now, is in our culture, most times, and this, this isn't for everyone, this is for most of what I've seen, what I've experienced, my own experience. Most of the time, you are required to not eat certain things, okay, or eat certain things you are required to dress a certain way and if you don't you are labeled it's slut shaming it's all kinds of different things that have nothing to do with the actual um expression of the way you dress you know Mm. fashion and style is an expression of who you are Mm -hmm. it's it's and especially growing up at that young stage you should be celebrated for you know how you want to be perceived but instead you know, it's looked down upon if your ankle is showing or, you know, you used to say before we met that you can even find a picture of me on on Facebook. I was going deep through the feed. I'm like, where is this girl's picture of her leg? (laughs) I'm trying to see something more than just her face. I mean, it looks good. Because we live in fear. We are taught to fear God. We are taught to live in fear of you know, what other people are gonna think? What are the aunties and uncles in my community gonna think if they see you wearing, you know, this, this, and that? And luckily, I was blessed to have my parents who aren't as intense or Mm -hmm. weren't as intense as the other people growing up. But it's, it's really about when you're not used to speaking your truth to your family, when it's not a common thing to go around the table and speak your emotions and your truth, you suppress it, right? right? But that's what you're used to. I didn't even know that it existed until I met you. I was like, so like, wow, your parents, right. you guys talk about everything. And it's yeah. just like, <laughs> if we ever said something like that, it'd be, it's disrespectful. You yeah. don't say that. Yeah. You don't, you just, why? Why can't you say that? Why can't mm. you speak your truth? And that was my, my biggest thing is that don't say anything. It's going to hurt this person's feeling. Don't say anything because that's, what are they going to think? Who the fuck cares, right? Yeah. To us, who the fuck yeah. cares? But to everyone else, it's the biggest thing, you know? Yeah, well, I remember I remember um, in Ibiza when we moved there, in like getting you to, to, to speak on a video, which was like something that you didn't, yeah. didn't do. This was just like four years ago, right? And, yeah. and all you did was just identify that fact that you suppressed your voice and you had anxiety and it went viral. like mini viral for you yeah. at that point in time, right? That was crazy. So that's an example, right? Because you don't have things. You're perfect, right? What do you mean? You have a perfect life. You wouldn't have dare have anxiety. Right. 
You wouldn't dare have, you know, something that's going to make, there's nothing wrong. This is my message is there's nothing wrong with feelings. <laughs> if you feel a certain way, right. reach out, don't suppress it. If you feel the need to do something that's different than the environment than you're, that you're in, it's for a reason. Um, yeah. And you shouldn't be confined to those spaces and you should reach out of that environment because usually that environment isn't healthy, right? right? Which then starts the process of the mind and starts to mess you up. And then you're, you're, everyone, you know, expects so much from you. And then um, you deep end conditioning. up deep conditioning and then you end up not having a good relationship with anybody. Right. Like your parents. Like your parents. And the people that you're supposed to, that are supposed to love you that you're supposed to love. For example, I was so terrified when I met Alexander to tell my father that I had found the love of my life who is white and non-Muslim. How the fuck was I going to express that? How? Because I was conditioned to think that it's not okay to bring somebody else in from your culture. I was conditioned to think that you know, it's not something that you do. You stick with your people, you stick with your tribe, you stick with your culture, mm. marry somebody Muslim. Everyone has to, you know, stay together. And then you start to think about it. Well, who ever really stayed together out of happiness from any mm. of this, right? And, um, well, you see a lot of forced marriages that forced, create huge. huge toxic, abusive scenarios. And, and that, that's what is bringing me to this point is, I didn't trust myself because I was conditioned by the surroundings of the other people to actually sit with my father and actually say, yo, this is who I love and this is how it is. Were you scared? I was petrified, so I didn't say anything, right? So, so, let me... so I pushed you away. Right. I didn't talk to you. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't, never met up with you. Yeah, yeah. You know? Um, so it just comes down to then you get afraid to do certain things and you suppress your voice and it really messes with your life. Then Let you, me ask you a question real quick. Yeah. Do you think like from the white boy perspective, yeah. right? Do you think that that's a form of racism? Yeah, of course. Like you can't marry him because of the color of the skin. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the fucking racist. <laughs> and but this is, I, I was mean, this never is, told that. Let's hold up a second. Yeah, yeah. I was never told I can't marry anybody because of the color of their skin. Never. Is it primarily religion? It's religion. Okay. It was religion for me. Right. So it's discrimination. Yeah. It's a form of discrimination. But I can guarantee you it would be really different if you weren't white. Right. You know what I'm saying? And this is interesting right now because I don't feel like I've ever necessarily experienced you know, racism. Right. I don't but think you experienced racism until you came into my family and saw it from everyone else and how they act just this concept and talking about it right now is kind of making me it's think like wow up. that that is a form i guess that is a, a form of discrimination right yeah um and i mean now don't get me wrong like we have a beautiful relationship with your parents and i never for a second felt that from them once we met i want to get that clear and we're going to talk about that one when we talk about the meeting of the parents um but that's an interesting concept being from the other perspective that i didn't think about so sorry, continue. Surprise. <laughs> 10 so, years later. <laughs> so um, moving forward then, so you decided to get out of Oklahoma, but before you did, um, you were an athlete, you were, you were going to college for volleyball, and then something happened that really changed the course of your life, right? Yeah, so I, um, I grew up with uh, the most amazing friends and family, and I was a a dancer and um, I played volleyball and I was super active and what I can say is that at a very young age I got my body taken from me right got into an accident in Oklahoma and I what happened I was driving out of a complex and I got hit um, by another car head-on and I was in a very um, old vehicle where the the old Jaguars, the the tanks are in the front, and so mm. it caught on fire, and I was caught in Didn't the car. In your car, like flip? yeah, I was caught on fire in the car for a while. I had burn marks everywhere. But your car flipped. Car flipped. Like that's it flipped and exploded and you were trapped in a burning vehicle. I calmed down. It didn't like explode, and I was like, I'm still here. It didn't. <laughs> I didn't. Yes, but it caught fire. 
and um, upside down. And I remember at that moment thinking, okay, this is it. I, I at that time had asthma. I don't anymore because I healed it. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember thinking, okay, this is it because I can't breathe, first of all, fumes, and then I pass out. I don't Locked remember. Out. Yeah. So you had a moment of thought that you said, you thought this is the end of my life. Yeah. What did that feel like? Um, to be honest, I don't really remember too much. I was so young, but I do remember thinking like this, this, I, this is it, you know? Like, oh. Yeah. <sighs> Take me. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Did you want to go? Um, no. I didn't. I didn't know what that meant then. Right. If you would ask me now, it would be different. Is there like a UFO that's going to come take me? This is amazing. Um, no, I was scared shitless. I remember that. And I remember thinking, well, I, I'm upside down. I couldn't cut. I couldn't get the seatbelt off. If I could get the seatbelt off, I could have crawled out somehow. So I, you were upside down, hanging? And trying to get my seatbelt off. And you got burns, right? Like yeah, you were I burned. remember. I yeah. got them lasered. We got them lasered together. I still have them on my feet, but I, um, I couldn't get my seatbelt off. And I remember always thinking still after to this day, I was like, I'm never going to wear my seatbelt because, <laughs> because huh? it just, you know, obviously I do, but I, I, I kept, I had like a, a anger towards it because I was like, if I could have gotten that, I could have gotten mm. out a little sooner. Right. Um, and fast forward to hospital, I was told by, of course, our, our lovely Western medicine, mm -hmm. um, people, the medical industry, the medical industry that I couldn't walk for a long time. I did physical therapy for a really long time. I had injections in my spine of what, like, uh, what who knows, it? probably like aluminum and, you know, yeah. you know, to deal with the pain of <laughs> children and like yeah. animals and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, to deal with pain and, um, and I, thought, okay, this is just my normal life now. I'm 19, I have to go to the hospital all the time. I get to go to physical therapy all the time. Like, I was getting into the mindset like, oh, this is my life now. Like, I'm, I'm sick. I'm gonna have to live with it, okay? I have chronic pain. Um, I'm on painkillers at 19, okay? I, which are, it's like 50 USD for a Tylenol at the hospital. Wow. Okay, so here I am. I'm the hamster on the wheel. She's got some issue. Let's not treat the cause. Let's just treat the symptoms. Let's keep her sick. Tell her she's not going to walk again. Tell her she's not going to be able to have children. There was a woman that told me I wasn't going to be able to conceive children. Are you serious? Because of how bad it was. And if I didn't show up, because I didn't want to go to her physical therapy. And if I wasn't going to show up, then I'm not going to have children. Okay? Wow. I remember crying after that session with my mom. And I was like, how is this all of a sudden, like one second, I'm wow. the star of like, you know, dancing, volleyball, like a life of the party. And the next second I can't um, have children. <laughs> cool. So obviously that was depressing. And that was also just what I had learned to accept. Right. So um, I would, you know, not wear heels and, you know, me and my shoes mm -hmm. I wouldn't wear heels and my back was hurting all the time and it just came to the point where I was had no idea that another world of any sort of holistic anything could help me right mm -hmm. I was in the program deep in the mm -hmm. program I was fully asleep so you were prescribed and subscribed to the fact that I this was, was going to be it subscribed and I was that was it I was living the American dream and I had to be asleep to believe it Ooh. you know what I'm saying girl talking and truth now so you were asleep so I was asleep for sure so then you you go to college you go to LA so then I go to LA and I um I meet the love of my life <laughs> and okay so you what you should tell the love story okay so I'll start from my beginning I'll bring us up to speed to the point where we both now meet here in LA sure okay cool um, you know, you just told me things that I didn't even hear about. Thank you for that. That was beautiful. Like what? Just talking about like not being able to have children and the fact that you were told that and, and you know, I've told you that. Right. I knew that. <laughs> I knew that. So yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks for Great. listening. <laughs>
Maybe I'm just just so sucked in by your beauty and your way of communicating that it just all feels new. Yeah, must be. So I um, I grew up in Los Angeles. I was born um, in Santa Monica and grew up in Malibu. And I got put into martial arts actually at a very young age. My father was a director or is a director. My mother um, came from London. My father from Toronto, so I'm like first generation um, American. So I guess you could say that, yeah, I mean, both my parents are immigrants. And um, they came, you know, searching for the American dream. Um, my mom was cutting hair at that time. And um, my dad was filming a movie at the time and she was cutting hair on the set. And then they met and fell in love and it was this whole story. And then, boom, I was born. And so around the age of like, I think, five, six or whatnot, I was put into martial arts. My brother, my older brother, he got me into martial arts. And, and so growing up, I, I, I learned a lot of them. We would go to these competitions where, you know, kids would come from all over the world to fight. And, um, and we would go as teams. And that was like my sport. I, I wasn't into basketball or football or anything like that. It was martial arts. I'd go to school. I would go. We would train. We would go to tournaments. And I didn't pretty damn good. I remember um, it was just like my life. And I remember I got up to the, my black belt, um, like the training right before my black, black, black belt, the, my test before my black belt, and I quit. And I, you know, thinking back, I still can't even remember why, because it was so much, but I just, I quit. Um, but that was really what indoctrinated me into understanding the mind, understanding discipline, which is so important, understanding the body, um, understanding respect, you know, like the act of like if you were to hit an opponent in in a tournament, right, and they were to go down, you would you would go and turn your back and you would kneel and you would you would bow bow down like out of a sign of respect. So it's all these things as a kid, you begin to learn this stuff, and I think that was really the catalyst for um, me moving in these modalities. As I went to um, college, my first year in college at Southern Oregon University. I, Wait, you moved to Oregon? Yes, yes, skip that part. So, so yeah. Why? Basically, my parents wanted to get me out of Los Angeles. They wanted to get me Smart. out. Smart. Yeah, they, they knew that, you know, up to a certain age it would be good for me, but they didn't want me in that system. They didn't want me in the program. I think to this day it's the greatest thing that they probably yeah. did for me. I grew up on a farm in Oregon. We lived in Canada. We lived all over the world. I yeah. mean, I lived in Africa. I lived in... Um, in Europe, we traveled the world because he was shooting films, my father. And so I got to grow up also immersed in creativity and storytelling and in media. And I thought that that was going to be my path is that I was going to become a director and shoot films. And that was going to be the main thing. And so we, um, we ended up on a farm in, in Oregon and, um, and that's where I was raised. And I understood the, the circle of life. You know, I, 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 we had horses and cattle and we farmed and we fished and we swam naked in the creeks. And there was like, it was free. It was completely free. It was a backwoods, backwoods town, right? Yeah. So you say like growing up in nature shaped you. Yes. Yes. I mean, I was primarily raised in a Christian um, upbringing. And I remember, you know, being dragged to church every Sunday and just hating it, feeling so disconnected from what the true source I was being taught and was. And what happened at your church that made you feel that way? Um, there was a few things that happened. I'll, I'll say this, that, you know, it was always about this, you know, finding God, right? And every Sunday, religiously, we would go and we would drive 30 minutes to the church in the next neighboring town. And I would fall asleep the whole the whole time. It was in, just like nothing activated. Yeah, nothing. Act it was a struggle for me to stay awake because it, it, it didn't move anything in my soul. It, it was the opposite. And, um, and so what, when I found what people were calling God, I found it when I was in the forest. I found it when I was a kid. I would, I would go through the forest. I would spend my days in the forest and I would feel spirit. I would feel nature. I would, I would feel that connection. And I remember like sitting on rocks and feeling sun coming through the trees and like speaking to God you know, as a child, because we all have that connection, you know, when we are, are that young. And it actually makes me emotional thinking about it because it's like it, the children, we know how to access that. It's, it's there, you know what I'm saying? And it's, it's oftentimes 
stripped from us the by, <laughs> by, from the system, whether it's religious, educational, and all of that, which yep. we'll get into. So I, that's how I grew up. And, um, and then when I finally went to college, I met uh, a martial arts instructor who was very underground. It was very much about combat, practical combat in the streets. What do you do if you're being attacked by one guy, five guys, six guys? How do you defend yourself, mm -hmm. real and raw? Um, this was kind of when this whole terrorist thing was going down. I remember that one training was, um, you know, it was after the whole 9-11 thing. It was like, what to do if like a terrorist attacks you on the plane and teach you how to grab a pen and grab the throat and where to stab somebody, like that type of stuff, right? So it was a complete energetic shift, but on the other hand, from what I learned, which was about Imagine peaceful. Imagine being the terrorist on the plane that people think you are. Exactly. Well, there you go, right? right. Yeah. So. I learned um, through this mentor, and it really was a mentor at this time, I learned about energy, really about energy, how to use energy in combat, so how you could unzip it, unzip it was called, how to learn about the meridian points, how to use your mind to affect the opponent, so you could literally unzip their energy field, you could implant the thoughts that you wanted, and you could decrease their energy so that you could essentially win in your fight. That's fascinating. And the other hand of it is that you could unzip people and then you could also implant the good and you could help people heal. And so you, I learned about how to take energy bodies and create them in the room. And um, again, when the teams would go to, to tournaments and whatnot, the, the students would sit around and they would unzip the opponents of the, their teammate who was fighting and they would win everything, right? So how old were you when you were unzipping so this was people? Seven, this was 17 when I learned how to unzip. But we got into much more than that. We got into remote viewing, Is that right? how you got me? Maybe. <laughs> it was the guitar, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we learned about how to remote view, how to project yourself outside of your body to view another place in time and see it in detail. We learned about um, NLP. Was yeah. this a specific person or is it, was there a school like this in Oregon or who? This was, this was, um, this was a, a teacher of mine who was teaching me these things as it related to life and accessing your extrasensory perception. So I also learned from Jose Silva right, and the Ultramind wow. system. And Which is just now becoming popular. Yeah, well, I mean, over 9 million people went through it. He was pioneering this stuff in the 60s. 60s. And yeah, now Mind Valley yeah. and Vision have picked it up and they're repackaging it, right? So I was doing this at 17 and learning how to visualize the outcomes in life that you wanted, but the practical steps on how to do that, whether it's acing your test or, you know, getting the things that you wanted from a 17-year-old mind, that's what I was thinking, right? And when you were in this school and then going to your regular Oregon school, were you... Just like, partying. Thrown off? The, I, I didn't care. It was, it was, it was, this was fascinating. That was what you I had went there for that passion school. for. Yeah. Okay. I remember grad, or not graduating, I left after freshman year and I went to a um, uh, journalism department at the U of O because I wanted to get into their film program. I just wanted access to camera gear. Um, I remember the, the things that haunted me the most were this, was this feeling like I was pulled away from that teaching. That I yeah. wasn't going to that school anymore. And for years, I had dreams about it. Like, it, it gutted me. I, I remember thinking, like, did I make the wrong decision? Not because of the college I was going to, because I was awakening. I was learning these things. Now, I never thought that I would end up using it for... Because they don't teach you that anywhere else. No, 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 not at all. But that's what they should be teaching you. Every right. child should be growing up, being taught how to meditate, how to connect with their center, how to influence the world around them positively, right? I mean, these are the fundamentals of life that are pushed away because the second you realize that, you awaken to your power. And the last thing that the system and the governments want is a bunch of people running around woke, realizing their power because then you can't control them. Um, you know, fast forward to essentially, you know, I got into acting and um, uh, went into film. You didn't just get into acting. You were in that one little show called Twilight, weren't yes. you? Yes, that's what happened. So I'm in, I'm, in, um, I'm in my film program at the Art Institute of Portland, and part of the program for the directorial program was to learn how to act so you could become a better director. So I was taking these acting classes in my um, instructor. Did you actually take them? Or did you yeah, no, them? I loved it. It was cool. That's funny. That's hilarious. She's killing it. And so... 
Um, I actually loved that part of it, and I didn't realize because I never thought once that I wanted to become an actor. So, my teacher said, "Hey, you know, you've got talent in this. You should consider, you know, taking it professionally." Because he was a professional actor. Shelley Lipkin, shout out to the homie, man. Thank you. And um, he was an incredible man. And he got me an agent, and I started going out on auditions for like local pizza shops and like insurance companies and like silly shit like that. And then all of a sudden, I get called in for this movie called Twi Twilight, and I didn't know anything about it at the time. This is like 2007 or eight, something like that. The most gigantic. I had no idea. Film. Saga no idea, in and they the were world. shooting in Portland, so it came knocking on my door, and so I went in for frat boy number one. Yes. Yeah, I was the dude who got kicked in the nuts by Kristen Stewart right before Robert Pattinson came up and saved the day, and that was that was my 15 minutes of fame. You deserved it. I did, and so I went in for the audition. Um, I got shortlisted for that, and then Catherine Hardwick, the director, came up for the auditioning process and called me in like one late night. I was like hanging out with my friends and I got a call from the casting director said, Catherine wants you in the, in the room right now, can you come? I'm like, Who, who's Catherine? The director of Twilight. I'm like, uh, okay, let's go. I didn't, I didn't even think I had a car. I, like, <laughs> like, I had to borrow my friend's car to get down there and, um, and I ended up going into the audition and it was amazing, like she was so amazing and we, we like, we, we spent like a good hour in the room doing the audition and... Um, this was all in Oregon? This was all in Oregon, yeah. And in the end I got like a standing ovation from the casting director and the producers and her and I was shortlisted then for the role of, um, of his brother, of Edward's brother, um, uh, played by Kellen Lutz. So I was in that shortlist for weeks. And in that time I, I remember then researching the film like holy shit. If this happens, it's done. Like ev my life is going from down here, like nothing to, boom, superstardom, and that's what I caught the bug, you know. And um, I didn't obviously get that role, but I thought, wow, like in an instance, your life can change like this. So I went down to L.A. I packed everything I owned, which wasn't much at all. I got my memory foam mattress, and then I like threw in like all of my Fourth of July. Yeah, Fourth of July. I moved to Los Angeles, two thousand nine, and um, I hit LA again. So it was like I came full circle, right? I lived in Silver Lake. My friend um, was out there who gave me a room. I literally put that foam mattress on the floor, sleeping in a little tiny room, which was like I a closet. Yep, I that was that. right before I met you, and. I walked into every audition like I was the shit, like it was just gonna happen, like it was gonna be easy for me. And I remember just eating shit so quickly and becoming dead broke and thinking to myself, wait a second, this is not it. You know, coming from, you can manifest anything, you know how to manipulate energy, you can remote view, NLP, this, you are almost the star with here, and then all of a sudden, boom, grinding halt. It was the first time I felt so alone. I remember during 2008, that was when the bubble popped in, in the States and everybody lost their money. My parents almost lost their home. You know, I had always had that safety net. I, I lost the safety net and it was scary. I remember it was really scary. I remember I'm in a new, new place, even though I'd grown up there, but didn't really remember, you know, I'm like gunshots out the window, like, like no money, like broke, like thinking to myself, holy fuck, how am I going to make this happen? And, um, and then that's when I was down and out that um, I went to Burning Man. And Burning Man was my first awakening. Yes, and why? What happened so, at Burning Man? So going- Fast forward it. Fast, make it quick? Yeah. Yeah, all right. So going to Burning Man, I mean, it was the first time that I experienced a, a cultural expression of people who were different, who, who collectively were coming there for a conscious, a conscious purpose. Um, and there was no time, there was no money, there was, you were stripped of the confines of the program and for that moment in time a city is built and you experience this incredible, energetic, creative, artistic experience. And um, I was terrified because of my programming of, of anything, like I think the, the most I had done is like smoke weed at that point in time. And um, I had my first acid trip at Burning Man. And it was um, a complete revelation to me. I, I, I could like go on about that whole experience, but I felt 
for once what it felt like to have unity and this concept of being content mm. a beautiful feeling of content contentness contentedness that just washed over me during that time riding my bike seeing all the swirling of like the craziness but being so centered so connected and i remember being at at um at this fire and feeling the drum beat and feeling the fire and feeling the energy of all of this and seeing my my angel i remember seeing an angel and and that was it like i remember going back home after that and like walking down the street and looking at trees made me cry like it, it was it opened up everything in me what did you invent and from that i was inspired by all of the vaudevillian fashion and the 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 faux fur fashion and and whatnot that was out there and so i ended up um hand stitching these animal hoodies right like just yeah. for fun i was giving them to friends and family and you put your your hood on and it could be a cheetah or a leopard or a monkey or whatever and um and i was giving them out uh just just for fun and i remember i was wearing one in a la club once and um, my friends just said, you know, come out with me. You know, I was feeling down and out. And I said, fuck it, I'm gonna rock my little Burning Man hood. And we went to like this pretentious LA party and I walked in there and it was like, time stood still. Everybody was just like, Arr! like, who the f is this guy? What did it look like? It was like this weird nappy cheetah looking thing with like some ears poking up the side. It was a leopard. Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a leopard. So that was the first one. you had a little leopard on your head. Yeah, that was it. And, um, and people wanted to take pictures and they wanted to come up and buy me drinks and this and that. And I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Like from zero to 100, you could just be like a rock star. I mean, it was incredible. I, I was like, I got to see if this could be repeated. And I started wearing them out while driving and walking. I would be stopped in the streets wearing this thing. And I said to myself, oh, my goodness, this has got to be so, this got to turn into something. something. And I had no uh, business experience. I didn't obviously go to school for business, but I knew that this was a product because it was all about tapping into your wild self, expressing yourself freely, like connecting to your spirit animal, which was, a, a, you know, really important to me about, you know, um, connecting to that, that primal instinct that we have in ourselves and expressing it in a full, uh, like a fun, like cool way. Yeah. And it was, um, it was, we launched the business. I, I started the business and... What was it called? Spirit Hoods. Spirit yeah. Hood. So in the first year we launched it, I went from broke. We did our first million in the second year. We did 4.5 million and um, it was off. We're on Shark Tank. We're on the heads of every celebrity like Justin Bieber and Snoop Dogg and... I just want everyone to hold on for one second. At 23 years old, you launched a multi-million dollar company with the idea that sparked from unity and love and um spirit and spirit yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely side note and it was my subconscious desire of wanting that unity wanting to feel connected to a tribe wanting to feel connected to people in a society that had programmed me to be completely disconnected Woo. disconnected yeah and so looking back at like the things that I wrote back then, it was all about wanting to find myself in the interconnectedness of everybody yeah and so that's and during the time that back. I, yeah, we well, gave back to nonprofits that helped endangered animals. And I became obsessed with the power of a for purpose business for influencing positive change. And, um, and that's when I met you dancing in a field at Coachella. When it was cool and it was one weekend Yeah, and we didn't have a care in the world. So I went out to Coachella um, with my crew and we had put like all of our money, which was like 9,000 bucks into like these hoods. We made all these hoods and, um, we drove this Winnebago out there called War Pony, fueled on hopes and dreams, out to Coachella, War and we were Pony. running, we were running around with our hoods on. And then in this field, I see this beautiful woman, this goddess, just dancing in the field, spinning and twirling like a sage, like a dervish. And um, I said to myself, "Oh my goodness, wow! Look at that woman! Look at that woman! She's incredible!" But I didn't approach because she wasn't dancing for anybody else. It was really for herself. <laughs> And um, later that night, I had a little more courage in me and I'm running through the, the crowd of 100,000 people and then boom, there she is again. I see Shayun dancing in the field again and I wasn't going to miss that opportunity. So I ran up and I grabbed her hand and I whisked her away and um, I held her for, from behind and I said, let's take a breath, breathe in, feel it. The music from the DJ dropped, fireworks went off, our souls united and connected and it was like, oh, the angels came and we were connected again. We That's were one. That's his version. <laughs>
It's true. So that happened. And so then that was the meeting of of us. Us, and we just celebrated ten years together. Yes. That was boom, baby. That was Coachella 2010. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Wow. And so coming back to the cultural programming, I mean. So coming back to cultural programming, I'm spinning in a field, um, and I we were supposed to meet up again that night, and it didn't work out for many reasons, and. Um, I remember the power of manifestation, the power of the universe bringing us together again. I didn't have his phone number. I didn't know where he was from, nothing. I didn't even know he lived in LA. And I was at the Roosevelt one night with all of my homies and I look down at the end of the bar and he's like, oh my God. And I'm like, no way, dude. Again. Again. And, um, I gave him my, my number and he's like, I've been looking for you, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. Let's, you know, you want to hang out? And I would always say, yeah, let's hang out. And, um, she never would, by the way. So it was this mind fuck. I was in my, I was fucking with his mind. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause you were scared. Long story short, that happened three more times at the same bar. And I was like, okay, this is a sign. Like, this is crazy. Whether you're following me and you're a stalker or like God really wants us to be together. And he was like, just <laughs> hang out with me. Like, why won't you hang out with me? And the truth is I couldn't hang out with you because I was so scared of the color of your skin, the, the fact that you weren't Muslim. And I had never been taught in any form from not just, it's not just my parents, by the way, it's the whole culture in itself that it was okay to explore outside mm. of that. And so in my head, it was done. It's just, it's not going to happen. Right. Um, you didn't want to go down that Even though my hole. brother set the example for me years and years and years ago, he, he, he's still married to my sister-in-law and she's, um, she's white and that didn't go down good mm. in my family at all. So mm -hmm. I was like, I was traumatized from that and still to this day they're married. Yeah. And um, so I had, you know, I guess you would say a little PTSD from that. Right. So in my head I was like, there's no way <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not even going to entertain this, you know? Mm -hmm. And I had previously been in horrible relationships with people from my culture and religion and it was the most terrible thing I've ever experienced in my life. You experienced physical abuse and like all sorts of things. Physical, right? mental, verbal, just, it, it was, um, it's what I had to go through to get to this point, right? right. But it shouldn't have to happen. It does right. not have to happen is what I'm saying. So I never gave him the chance that he deserved because I was conditioned to be a discriminatory brown girl that's not supposed to be with a white boy. Mm -hmm. um, and then I saw something that I've never seen in anyone before and I fought him on this for a really long time. I didn't believe a word he said ever. <laughs> me? Yeah, because he was too good to be true for me. <laughs> Everything he did was perfect. It's true. His outfits were so bad. That was probably the only thing that was bad. He, Girl, you, I had swag. You, you know wore it. wore glasses that turned dark. It was so creepy. We yeah, were like that way you don't need two pairs, you know? It was so bad. You had like spiky, it was so bad. <laughs> and I was like deep in the fashion scene, like, I cannot, why do I like this guy? Dude, I was rocking Doc Martens, man. Like I was so ahead of the curve. No, you did it when it wasn't cool. Yeah, because I was so ahead of the you curve. You were behind. You just didn't leave. I was leave. so ahead, I was behind? You didn't leave the curve. Like you just stayed there <laughs> and without any like, Soap or anything. Whatever, girl. Just go on. I washed. <laughs> Dirty ass <okay>. river boy. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I am going to, am I really falling in love with this white boy, this non-Muslim white boy that dresses like that and lives on a foam mattress? Like, that's what you're going to do? I think I busted my, my, sh my ankle Oh, up and too. he was on fucking crutches. <laughs> <laughs> he was on crutches. And it I'm was like, not working out for me. I'm like... <laughs> I'm like, I'm, this is bad, guys. I'm falling in love with this girl. And I'm like, I got to invite her over with a, with a busted ass ankle living on the floor, like eating tuna out of a can. That wasn't even mine. I'm stealing it from like my, my roommate. Alexander was stealing food and sleeping on a foam mattress when I met him. And that's how I fell in love with <laughs> that's him. That's love, baby. 
It was the guitar. It was the guitar. Let me, can I tell them this? Yeah, story? sorry, I keep going. So I was literally in my head like, how the fuck am I gonna tell my mom and my dad this, you know? like. And I started to see truth. I'd never in my life seen somebody so young yet so advanced spiritually about what it is that he wanted. He, he knew what he wanted. Late, actually, in life later, he told me he, and showed me that he had written when he was 17 in a notebook that he wanted to marry a brown girl. So talk in about LA. like manifestation I knew it, in yeah. real time. And he would always keep every promise. He treated me so well. He was so intelligent. He knew everything about anything. I always joke about him. I'm like, he's such a genius. He knows everything about everything. The only thing he can't do is speak a language. We're working on that. A language? What am I speaking now, woman? It's barely English. Excuse me. <laughs> but he can't speak another language outside English. And I was like, how is this possible that somebody can be too good? Like he's too good to be true. And I just was programmed to not believe it because of all the shit that I had um, gone through relationship wise before. And, and he said to me, what is your problem? Like, why won't you just, yeah. why, why can't you just, you know, Kick see it. it? Yeah. And, um, and then I fell really, really deeply mm -hmm. in love with him for who he actually was. And I was the brown girl who was deep in the scene of the fashion and the labels and the bullshit and the, you know, the, the life that I would never imagine for myself sleeping on a foam mattress in a little ass room. She was taking care of me. I was taking care of him and he was stealing yeah. food from his neighbors. Yeah. And I didn't know when I met this dude that I had a fucking leopard on his head that it was going to turn into a huge multi-million dollar yeah. company overnight. I didn't know any of that. All I knew was his heart. Yeah. And I felt him, and for the first time, I, I doubled down. I remember writing a letter to your father when it came to that point. Oh my God, okay, so then, you know, white people, they move quick. They're like, let's go to my, <laughs> let's go to my parents' house this weekend. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I can't meet your parents. <laughs> like, I just barely said yes to you. And, um, and then our moms met yeah. first yeah. in LA, and then, um, it came to the point where I had to say to my dad, like I met someone and I have never been so scared of anything in my life ever. I remember that. And I thought the world was going to fall out from underneath you. Yeah. And I, um, I had mustered up the courage and my dad said to me, okay, this is really beautiful. And I want everyone who is of color to understand this. I had the worst anxiety of my life. I did everything in my power to not have this conversation and it took everything in me to have this conversation. And even when I was having the conversation, I found myself lying about what it was that I was trying to say because I was trying to cover up the fact that I was in love because it wasn't okay that I was in love in my head with a white boy and somebody from a different religion. So I, was like I met somebody and you know like I met him at like this like outside like the mosque <laughs> <laughs> not high on ecstasy at Coachella and <laughs> um and he was like oh great why don't you invite him to the IFA film awards in Toronto and I was like what and he was like invite him let's meet him and I was like is this really happening? Like, that's it? What do you, you're not mad at me? You're not going to kick me out, cut me off? Like, what, what do you mean? And I was like, Alex, you said that, like, you can come to Toronto. And he was like, I told you, just speak your truth and be real. And mm -hmm. that's exactly what happened. That's right. And in Kenya, when you want to marry the king's daughter, you have to bring a, a lion as a sacrament and gift. So what did you do? So then what I did was I took a lion spirit hood and I wrote a letter and she didn't even know that I, I wrote this letter to her father just expressing my heart and um, I sent him that letter and we went out to Toronto and what I'll, did it say well that's between me and him Damn it! I still try to get it out I still don't know what it said and I spoke my truth and from a father hearing that you know understanding what I think the purity of our love was was the catalyst and I remember she was freaking out. I was freaking out. I'm but going, I knew, I knew that that love it always triumphs. I was you know, going it always to triumphs. Toronto with my boyfriend. You don't have boyfriends. We, I've never had a boyfriend. You know. 
And so to me, it was like, my father knows I have a boyfriend. Like, this is so weird. And on top of that, he invited him. So on our airplane ride, I was freaking out. Yeah, and I remember coming down the escalator and just seeing him and seeing your father, and it was so beautiful. We like literally, and I saw this before it even happened, talk about remote viewing. He and zipped him. <laughs> and we just hugged and we both cried and it was this amazing connection. And, and that was it, you know, it, it, the, I'd never, now this is important to understand too, coming from the other side of it, coming from the program of Islam is, they're terrorists, it's to be feared. They are a threat to our country. They are a threat to our freedom, which is disgusting and so far from the truth. When the love that I felt from her father and her mother in those moments was some of the deepest love that I've ever experienced in my life, still to this day. And I learned that the cultural programming and even at that point in time, considering that I was on the path you know, and somewhat um, awake that I was ignorant enough to even have that reservation with, with Islam and that culture, thinking like, oh my God, like maybe I won't be accepted. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's something to fear here. When I experienced more acceptance through that culture than I did in, in my own. And that still to this day continues. And it was so powerful and so beautiful. And from then on, it was like this, that was it. You know, we got married, we, we did our thing and we continued on the path. And I think, you know, when, when we came together, that's when obviously, you know, you're my soulmate. We've been together for, for years. We need to get into now the path of awakening together. Yeah, and just for a second, the moral of that is you cannot be afraid to use your voice. You have to use your voice for the truth. And when you do use it for the truth, no matter what the outcome is, it's what happened within you that releases something that will in turn give you something great. And even if people don't accept your truth. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. We are fortunate because her family did. But even if they didn't, that wouldn't have changed anything in regards to my love for her and what we would create. We cannot silence our truth we cannot silence love and we always say that love is meant to inspire and when you are moving in love, when you're moving in your truth, no matter what, it is always the right decision. No matter how difficult, no matter how crazy it might seem, no matter how strong the program is, you will always be rewarded in the end when it comes to the judgment day, so to speak, meaning what ends up happening and manifesting in your life. And it's when you suppress that truth, when you suppress what's real, that that begins to manifest the, the anxiety, it begins to manifest the worry, the stress, the pain, the suffering, and then that in turn turns into disease. And this is what we're unpacking now with everybody that we work with moving forward, right? Speaking of, so that whole journey, it took us all of that to obviously go through Everything that we went through in our fast life from Los Angeles to the scene to, you know, everything that no longer served our higher purpose from everything that um, we weren't vibrating with anymore, we decided to make a shift and to move into purpose and to really be around and make a difference in the world. Our difference was that we had to leave the area in which was sucking us. LA was n not feeding our soul. And we definitely didn't want to raise a child um, in a place that we felt that way. Um, no disrespect to anybody that does, but it just wasn't our journey or our path anymore. And we also, um, you know, you outgrow people, you outgrow places, you really wake up. And my big awakening was the fact that I was with Alexander one day. And mind you, being with Alexander in itself is healing. He's probably the most positive person I've ever met in my life. And for that, for you to be around that every day, which is why environment is so key, is it really awakens something inside of you when you see a different side of what you're used to. And so it, whenever I started to trust in that and trust in happiness, like, wow, I'm happy and, and it's a real thing. Like, 
I wasn't surrounded by people who were ever really truly happy from inside out. And so I started to become happy from inside out. And that was my awakening. My awakening came from appreciating and realizing what it is on the other side, what it is within myself that I have suppressed my whole life. And I was sitting with him one day um, and I closed my eyes and I opened my eyes all of a sudden and he was a bright rainbow in terms of color. And I didn't say anything again because that's what I'm used to, just not saying anything. He's going to think I'm crazy. And of course, because he's so in tune and, you know, he looked at me and he said, do you see color? Well, she, she like opened her eyes and she jumped back. She was like, <gasps> And I'm like, what, what? And she's like looking past me, right? And I had learned back in my, in the, the mentor I was telling you about energy work and whatnot. We, we learned how to read auras and you were looking past me and kind of like putting your hand in it. And I was like, do you see color? Do you, do you see? And you turned on, didn't you? And because I felt safe in a safe place, I admitted to it. And so I, that began my journey of awakenings. I was able to see color, which is, the most beautiful gift. At that point, I didn't consider it a gift um, yet because I was so scared and I didn't know and I, I was just really anxious about it. So I, the crazy shit started happening to me after that. And um, it was all a part of my journey of my awakening. But what it did do is it unlocked my power to believe in myself, right? So I, matched with somebody who supports that, who understands the spirit world, who says, you're not crazy. Mm. There's nothing wrong with you. You actually have a gift. And I'm like, oh my God, wow. And I'm like, what is this gift? And I started to be able to see color in people and mm. in, in things and in their bodies. In to, plants. In yeah. plants and, and animals. To where I could help them if they were hurting or had pain and whatnot. And so I started, the switch was, I stopped shunning my gift and I started using it to help other people. Now, can you just talk about real quick, like when it activated, you actually felt anxiety, right? I was so distraught because it was so intense and it came on so quickly that I couldn't handle it. So I did what I did best being an American. I got on antidepressants. I got um, anti-anxiety anti pills. Anti pills. I got diagnosed with chronic anxiety. Um, so you thought you were going crazy, I right? I thought I was going crazy. And of course, they, they just feed into that. There's no, you know, there's no recognition of what the cure of that could actually be. So let's just put you on more pills. Yeah. What the actual root is, which is a gift, yeah, right? They treat no, it as like, a, you know, disease. So once again, Big Pharma, I was on um, medication for having an imagination that was real. And... Um, and I quickly, it was dimming my light. And I noticed how I felt lit. And I noticed that that wasn't real medicine. And so after I stopped that and I stopped shunning the light and I stopped shunning my powers is where I really came into my powers. And I realized that I'm here for a much bigger purpose. And I'm not supposed to sit here and just be medicated and have entertainment of programming that's just from TV and television and all this shit and you know like drugs and alcohol and party and being in the scene and blah 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 all faded away because I was starting to awaken to my purpose mm -hmm. and my purpose is to help others find their purpose so that they can heal and change themselves to change the world and that all starts started with finding it within myself and um then you made I, the choice. I made the choice. And then you started learning energy work, right, which furthered the experience. So then I, I got trained in everything. I did Reiki prana certificates and this and that. And I developed my own, um, my own practice, which is, we call it the light force energy practice, where I can basically go in and revitalize your entire body and soul from what it is that you tell me that you need. And we do it together with the client and patient and it's absolutely beautiful. And that's just one of the things that we've created. You healed your back from the car accident and all that trauma as well. That's a major part of it too. You were able to self heal. Huge. So we go to Vegas one year and I um, 
didn't want to go out because my back hurt. We went for a trade for show for spirit hoods. And he said to me, let me do something on you called EFT. And I was like, whatever, babe, do your spiritual shit on me. It's fine. It's not going to work. I've been, I was mad. I was mad at my body. I was mad. I had to take the medicine. I was mad. I couldn't go to the party. I was mad that I was there. I was just pissed about everything. And I was like, whatever, do your spiritual shit on me. Cause at that point I had no idea that it was the biggest gift in the world. And he did something on me called EFT for 10 minutes. And he took years of my life of pain and anxiety and brought me back to my youth within 10 minutes because I learned to forgive my body. I never had the concept in my head that I can forgive my body. And the second I forgave my body, I was in downward dog FaceTiming my parents. Look, I could touch my toes again. Mm -hmm, that's right. And that's that woke the spirit in me yeah, because I had never, no one had ever given me an, another alternative besides a pill or an injection. Yeah. There was no other <clears throat> healing. So self healing is real. And in that moment, and this is key to understand is that it's every physical ailment most of the time, right? Comes from an emotional and negative emotional experience, normally trauma. So for her, it was the trauma of the accident. It was the fact that she was mad at her body for giving her this pain and she was mad that it happened because it took everything away from her. But the second that she forgave that, boom, the body self-corrected instantaneously. And we talk about instant healing all the time and people, you might listen to this and say, well, that's, that's crazy. How can people instant heal? We're going to show you as we progress through this series that this is exactly how it works. Yeah. And so we decided, I started having visions of the center. There was the center somewhere in the Mediterranean that people could come and I was going to create. And I dreamt of of this place that is now the Light Force Center. And we went to Europe for a few months to discover the place that I was dreaming about. And I thought it was Greece. I thought it was this place or that place. And we landed in Ibiza and I have never felt more home in my life. And we currently um, are living there. We've been there for four years. We packed up everything and said goodbye to the old life and hello to the new life of transformation, change, purpose. And that's all we do all day, every day. Yeah. And I mean, during that time, I had started seeing her awaken. I started seeing you move in your spirit and your gifts. And, and I was being pulled away from the, the business world, from the program of work harder, do this, do that, build, 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 build. I had set up spirit hoods in the beginning to create a lifestyle for me and my family where we could live remotely, where we could kind of live that dream of freedom. And it was just sucking more life out of me, more 24 hour work days, just more, 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 more. And um, through this process of, of her visions and her dreams and which were oftentimes manifesting and coming very real, um, I started receiving through my own meditations that I needed to experience and create um, a, a healing modality that I could take to this place that we were going to find. So I started learning quantum healing hypnosis um, techniques and started working with people and you started working with people and we were doing our first work um, in Los Angeles when we moved to Ibiza, I sold the company Spirit Hoods and we packed up our things and we moved to the island and that was it. That was it. And now we are opening a center and we just, um, we came to Bali a few months ago for Aya's birthday, our son Aya's birthday for a few weeks. And before that, everything was all over the place. He has also another company called The Disruptive. It's a conscious agency in Ibiza. I had the Light for Center Boutique um, and Apothecary. It's all high vibrational supplements. Um, and I was the first to bring any of that to to the island and we were in so many different places at so many different times that we never actually came together like this until we got stuck in quarantine in Bali and we have developed the most beautiful course, um, which is what something we want to share with you that we just did the first run of and all of our students have experienced 100% healing. And that to me is the biggest gift. Of life. It's true. I mean, fast forwarding to, to this experience, you know, a lot of our work was in person and, um, and this made us question when everything shut down, well, how can we give 
these experiences to people remotely and in that process of meditating and pulling all of our collective life experience that we just talked about and more together we form it's more than a course it's like it's almost you can't say it's a course because it's it's this isn't something you subscribe to when you check boxes and fill out forms we're talking about self-healing and self-transformation the whole reason why we're telling you this story is to kind of just hopefully see connections in our experience that might inspire you to realize that healing and purpose and transformation is real and we do not have to be a part of the system to experience it that if you're feeling a calling to something that's real something that's true outside of what you've been told by your family by religion by culture by this it doesn't make you a bad person it means that you're curious the concept of awakening means that you have to understand that you've been asleep when you sleep you aren't conscious of the fact that you're asleep so the first stage of awakening has to be the question Am I asleep? Are you asleep? Is what I'm being told not real? Do I need to open my eyes and awaken to something, to the magic that is incredible, that's all around me, that you probably felt when you were a kid, that you probably felt going up, that was probably suppressed? And when you begin that journey, there's a very specific process that, that we can take you on, that we take people on. And you can find source, you can find God, you can find connection through millions of different ways, millions of different perspectives because there's billions of different people on this planet and we are all a reflection. It's like a mirror that's been shattered reflecting different parts of the puzzle and our, our experience is designed. The reason why we're here is to realize ourselves, to put those pieces back together and as we put those pieces back together we realize that we're just reflecting the same truth and it doesn't matter where you're coming from. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your religion. It doesn't matter how much trauma or abuse you've suffered. You can experience enlightenment. You can experience awakening. You can experience love. You can experience healing. And the key is you've got to go back. You've got to fix and remap the trauma. You've got to clear it out. And when you do that, the body heals. And what we teach you is that. That's what we teach you, not the process you of self-awakening. Not only can you experience it, you deserve it. Yeah. You deserve to heal, you deserve to live a life of purpose and of truth. And so what we do is we, everyone asks me, so what do you do? And I think now is the best time to explain. We work with people on the daily that have suffered from everything, from deep trauma, sexual abuse, rape, you name it. It's cancer, diabetes, chronic illness, addiction, stress, or just people that are stuck, not yeah, even exactly. any of that. And the common denominator is that everyone suppresses what has happened to them or a certain instance in their life that they shunned away or that they pushed under the carpet. And our process gets you to the root like that. We go right into it. We ask you what happened, how did it happen, why did it, and we help you figure it out quickly and in that process you start to discover why everything happens and why you're here and how all of those negative experiences the darkness was necessary as a teacher to help you realize your own light the fact that we all we want and that all this 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 programming is for is we did put in the bubble to try to protect this this false belief of happiness when real really most people aren't happy we just want to be happy we want to be healed and we want to live and when we realize that the darkness and the experiences are actually the necessary teachers for helping us just simply realizing our own light then you reclaim your own power you stop becoming the victim of circumstance and you start realizing that everything is happening for you and not to you and in this process it's beautiful it's powerful it's gentle and that's what the light force center is about so i mean we we offer and I mean this is the beginning if you're listening to this you're like die hard because you've been with us for like yeah. almost two hours right now like but look we've got we work with people remotely four weeks seven weeks we're building the light force center in Ibiza which is a center of light for everybody from all over the world no matter who you are no matter where you're from to come heal transform and grow this is the beginning of the conversation and if you're interested just please subscribe to the channel check out all the links we're gonna put below you can join our free morning ritual program which is your first step in this process and please share this with people and let us know if you have any questions because we're here and we're building a true family and a true community and now has never been the a more important time 
with what's going on in the world, just note and watch as the media and the players on the field are looking to divide. They want to divide us. They want to separate, separate us. They want to do that through every single thing that we just mentioned in this conversation. But the way in which you heal it all is unity and harmony. And the only way in which we can create that harmony is creating the harmony within yourself. So you want to help? You want to change the world? You want to stop the discrimination? You want to help create an environment for your children? You want to live a life that's ha happy, happy and fulfilled? You want to attract the love of your life? The key is to start within and harmonize yourself within. And so that is step one. So come on in, baby. Let's go. And you can do all the yoga in the world. You can have all the practices in the world. You can eat all the best foods in the world. You can do all of those beautiful things which are necessary. But if you do not deal with what it is that has been holding you back this whole time, if you do not deal with the trauma, the pain, the suffering, mm -hmm. none of that is going to work. It's not going to do anything. It's not going to work. And so. you know it. If you've been to therapy, if you've been to every medical practitioner, if you've been bending upwards, leftwards, downward, hatha breathing up and down, left and right, asphyxiating yourself, and you still are suffering inside, that's because you have not dealt with the trauma and you've been programmed to think and we've been programmed to think that healing is something that is reserved for the few or that you got to be a yogi in the cave or meditate for 20 years. It's all bullshit. You don't. You do not. It can happen fast. It can happen immediately and it's accelerating the opportunity and the potential for you to do so because the new earth is emerging now and that's what this is all about. You have every right in this world to live a life of truth and purpose and you're put here for something and we want to help you align with that mission and your vision and your purpose and the distance between where you stand right now and achieving what it is that you desire is only, only as great, great as, as you, you think, think it to be. be so that being said join us on our next episode we're gonna be dropping this once a week and if you are listening to this, you are a ride or die for sticking with us this whole time. I mean, I feel like we had to get this out. It's been a long time coming. Yeah. So thank you so much. Peace we and love. We love you. Mwah!